Yo everybody, welcome back. This video we are going to continue our discussion on collections inside of Java and specifically I want to go in more depth on hash maps. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to understand how hashing works and how these data structures exist and how to use them. So we'll first approach it generally from like a computer science perspective and then we'll dive into the implementation inside of Java and how to actually work with these data structures. All right. So let's just look at some documentation on, on Wikipedia first. <laughs> so this is where we started. We started in this Java collections framework document. And we mentioned in the previous video that there's three, three different types of collections. One being the lists, which we talked about in the previous episode. And then we have dictionaries and maps. And then we have sets. So right now we're going to take a look at this category here, specifically hash maps and the way these things work is basically there's an association between two different things so for example you might have a, a list of people that work for a company and all the, these people have an id so there might be the id of five is caleb the id of six is sally and, and that is an example of how a, a map works we map an id to a person the hash part of it is where th things get confusing and people usually get lost. So we're going to take a moment to just discuss hashing and how it works. And I'm going to do this by explaining how I was first exposed to hashing. If you've seen some of my other videos, you've probably ha heard me go through this example, but it doesn't hurt to go through it again. So I'm going to go back to my starts, my roots, databases. And one really big thing in databases is sometimes you don't want information to be exposed for people to look at even if they have access to the database you, you might not want to expose that information anyways and a, a common example of this is passwords so obviously not everybody should have access to the database so that's the first layer of protection the second layer of protection is even if the person does have access to the database it doesn't necessarily mean you want them to be able to view everybody's password generally we want to keep that stuff private and obvious reasons, let's say, you know, we have a large company and numerous people are, are playing around in the database. If someone is malicious, they might be able to take people's passwords, leak them online, or use those passwords to try on different websites because most people reuse passwords on various websites. So we don't want to put that stuff in plain text. And the easiest way to prevent plain text is to use a process known as hashing. So all we would do is say, SHA-2, and this is going to take two arguments. It's gonna take some data, and it's going to take a bit length. So we'll run this. Oh, and we also have to say select. So we hit run, and here's the result we get. All right, so this is an example of a hashing function, and it takes some data and gives us some unreadable result that is exactly 256 bits long or 64 hexadecimal characters. So in other words, this is the person's password. So maybe we could use a more passwordy phrase here, password one, and then we can run this thing. And in the database, this is how the information is going to show up. Now, you might think, well, like, how is that useful for anything? You can't read it. Well, when the person tries to log in, they'll put in this password one, We'll run it through this SHA-2 function and we'll get the same exact value because each time we run this, we get the same exact output. So although we don't know what the password is, we're able to confirm that the password they entered is the same as the password in the database because we get the same exact hashing value. And this concept of hashing is fundamental for a hash table. So let's take a look at this Wikipedia article on hash tables scroll to the top and it's going to look something like this how it works so we put in some information so from our sql example we were using password one but we don't have to just use it for passwords we can also use it for keys so for example we could have the value john smith and we run it through that hash function so in the example we just had it would be that sha2 function but the actual function itself that's not what we're trying to talk about here. It's just basically going to go through some hashing algorithm. And the result is we are going to get the position to store this information. 
So I showcased hashing using this SHA-2 function 256-bit, which is often known as SHA-256. Now, the hashing that's going to happen inside of Java is not the same thing. There's not going to be a SHA-2 function. Rather, the hash map uses a method called hash code. You can look up the details of the hash code method if you want to know how it works, but every single object inside of Java is going to have a hash code method. So even in the situation of a string, for example, say string s and give it some value, you can actually say s dot hash code, and you can see the description here returns a hash code for the string. By the way, a hash code is another word for the output of a hashing function. So makes sense. The hash code for a string object is computed as, and then it gives the algorithm here on how it gets the hash code. So you can put that there. And what we can do is we can output this to see what the value is. Put that in a print line and hit run. And this is the value we get. So hopefully the SHA-256 didn't get you too far off of the target. Essentially, I just wanted you to understand about processing data and getting some output that doesn't necessarily mean something by itself. So if you're new to all this, it's probably a lot, but essentially we need to decide where this is going to go. And the way we do that is by processing it through a hashing function and using the result to decide where to put it. So you might look at the result of this here and be like, dang, that's a huge number. How exactly does that tell us where to store something in a table? Like in this example, you know, we got index one, index two, index three. That has nothing to do with that giant thing you just showed me. Well, usually there will be some kind of transformation that takes this giant key here and converts it to a number that is within a reasonable size. So if you want to see what something like this might look like, let's just say in code, let's do a sys out and we'll take this number, this giant number, and what we're going to do is we are going to use the modulus operator with the value 10. And when we run this, we can see we get the value six. So basically we could use a modulus operator as an example to get a, a reasonable index. So instead of using 10, we'll just use whatever size of the collection it is. So if we have a thousand spots, we could run this and you can see this is going to go to position 456. So that is how basically the hash value is converted to an index. So let's go back to the image and start from scratch. We have the value, goes through a hash function, we get some crazy number. That is then ran with the, the modulus operator to give us some index, and then the, the associated value is put there. So that's crazy, that's a pretty big process, but it seems to work. And the really cool thing about the hash table and the reason people use it is because retrieving the data is actually very fast. So when we want to get a particular value, we just pass in that key and it goes to that exact position and we get that data. Now there is one other thing you should know about with hash tables and we don't have to worry about it when we're using the hash map inside of Java, but it is good to know about and that is any form of conflicts. So for example, let's say we hashed John Smith and Lisa Smith. We processed it through a hash function and we, we did some conversion to get an index such as the modulus operator. And let's say they both ended up with the same index. And I think there's actually an image of this in this article. So taking a look at this, it's a little bit more complicated, but the main thing I wanna show you is that we have numerous people hitting the same index. Well, when that happens, there needs to be some kind of conflict resolution to decide how this information is going to be stored. And often, instead of just storing one piece of information at that index, we'll actually store a, a series of entries. So for example, it looks like this might be a linked list. We have John Smith, which then points to Sandra D. So if we wanted to retrieve the information, let's say we wanted to get Sandra's ID. We would pass in Sandra D and it's going to look at that index and it realizes John Smith is not the person. So it goes to the next thing and realizes Sandra D is right here and grabs that index. That's how it would logically work when we wanted to retrieve that information back 
from the hash table. Whew, okay, so that's pretty much everything you need to know from a computer science perspective of how hash tables work, how the, the hash output gets converted to an index, and then how we deal with index conflicts because often there's only so many spots to store things. So that's pretty much everything. And now what we need to do is we need to look about how this stuff is implemented in Java. And fortunately, a lot of this advanced stuff is taken care of for us and we can just use it like a normal collection, similar to how we would use an array list. So the actual using is actually pretty darn easy. So let's head over, head over uh, English. Let's head over to Java and type some stuff out. Very first thing, we're gonna get rid of that. And we're going to get rid of this array list. We're not working with those right now. And here is how we create a hash map. Lag, because I don't actually remember how to do it. So we'll say hash map. And we're going to use the less than and greater than sign. So it's similar to how we would do it with an array list, but it's something special because we're actually going to put two types in here. So let's say we want to pass in the person's name and we want to get their ID in return. So we're gonna say string for the name, comma, and then the type for an ID, mm, we'll probably go with an integer. So we'll just say integer like so. And then we'll just say the hash map is called IDs, and we'll say new hash map of type string integer, and then parentheses. So we'll need to hover over hash map and import it from java.util, and it looks good. Now, a thing you need to know about hash maps is if you open their declaration, the inheritance is not quite the same as with lists. So there's not a direct inheritance or implementation of the collection interface. So you can go through all this stuff. We can, implement, we can check out map, see it doesn't go anywhere. And you can actually see a photo of this on that Wikipedia article right here, actually. And this is actually the inheritance hierarchy for a map. So we're working with a hash map. This inherits from abstract map, which implements the map interface. So not all collections are pure collections in that they inherit from this collection interface. However, we can still use it pretty much the same. We're just not going to have access to all of the same stuff. So for example, inside of here, there is no method that is called add. So to add stuff to the collection, it's a little bit different. So let's talk about how to do that now. You can say IDs dot, and you can see if you type out add, nothing shows up, but you can say put, nope. We actually need to use put, and it will show up if you put the dot there, you can type this out and see the different options. And where is it gonna go with this, which takes the key and the value. So what key are we going to use? We're going to go with Caleb Curry, and what is my ID? We'll just go with five. So that is how we add something to the hash map. I'm pretty much mimicking this picture right here where we pass in the name for the key and get the ID as a result. You could flip it, you could make the ID the key, and as a result you get the person's name or the person's object if you have a class for a person or an employee or whatever it might be. But either way, the concepts hold the same. Pretty much we need a key and we need a value. So let's add another thing in here. Oh my golly, Pete's. So let's add another thing in here and we'll just go with Sally and she'll get the ID, whatever that number is. <laughs> Apparently I can't read numbers. Now to get the number, all you have to do, now to get the ID, all you have to do is say IDs dot get and you pass in the key which we'll pass in Sally and see what we get and we'll just take this whole thing and output it to see the result run this and you can see the value is 345 so you can tell that using the hash map is actually really easy. We don't have to worry about the hashing algorithm or anything with the modulus or conflicts. All of that is dealt with us behind the scenes. Now, if you're in a data structures and algorithms class, you might have to implement a hash map on your own. And in that situation, you can't just use the hash map 
data structure already given to us inside of Java. So good luck with that, but I'm sure you guys can do it, but that's not really the scope of this video. We're just worrying about how to use the hash map, and this is the basics. Next thing I wanna talk about is how do you update a value? Well, let's try this. We'll go and we'll put a new value for Sally, 344. Run this, and you can see it works. Now this works fine, but there may be a situation where if we need to reference that previous value, there could be an issue if there is no value there. So if you wanted to take the value and for example, increment it, that's going to be a problem. So what would that look like? We would just say IDs get, pass in Sally and increment it by one. Running this, we get 346. However, if we don't have this initial one here, we're gonna run into an issue where it crashes because we're trying to increment something that does not exist. So we get this null pointer exception. I mean, this is common sense. You don't wanna reference a value in a collection if that value doesn't exist. I mean, you guys should know that already from arrays and array lists. However, there is one thing we can do that's special with maps that might make your life a little easier if this is something you wanna do inside of a loop or something, and you're not entirely sure if that initial value will be there. And that is, instead of using this dot get, we would say get or default, and then pass in an extra argument of what we would want the value to be if we cannot find one. So for example, zero. Running this now, we get the value one. So basically it defaulted to zero, added one to it, and it worked. Now, how do you actually iterate through a map? Well, let's try it. So we'll get rid of this print line here, and we're actually going to use a for each loop. So we'll say for, and I'm gonna show you what I think is the easiest way syntactically, but there is another way, which maybe we'll get into that. So all you have to do is ahead of time, you need to say set and then string keys. And this is equal to IDs dot key set. And if you take a look at this method, it returns a set view of the keys contained in this map. Changes in the map are reflected in the set, yada, 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 and so forth. So type that out, and then inside of the for loop, you can say string key colon, and this comes from the keys variable we just created, and then we can access them here. So for example, we could just sys out the key. Oops, this should be capitalized, sorry about that guys. Run this, oh man, and we need to import that from job.util, run this, and check it out, we got one for Sally and we got one for Caleb Curry. And notice the order here, it's not necessarily that Caleb Curry comes first and then Sally next. It, it's not really guaranteed what order because we're doing the hashing and so forth. If we want to access the value, all you'd have to do is say ids.get and pass in the key, like so, and we could output that as well. Run that, we get Sally one, Caleb Curry five. Now this is the easiest way in my opinion to do it because it makes sense the best to me, but this key set method, there's actually another method you could use which is entry set, which is going to contain the key and the value and we can maybe talk about that later or you can research how to use that method if you'd like. And you can see the description is very similar for entry set as it was for key set. And there's actually a third one, which is values. So ids.values. So those are the three different views that you can get of this map and you can research those more if you like. So that is how to use the hash map. Again, the benefit here is that if you need to retrieve data using the key, it's extremely fast because it just hashes it gets the location and grabs that data extremely fast. So that is why you would want to use a hash map. And that's all I got for you guys in this video. Hopefully it was helpful. I know it was a lot, so rewatch it again if you need. And let me know what else you guys would like to see in the upcoming videos. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one.